Welcome. Uh, I'm sorry. We begin uh, looking at day three aimed at, I'm sorry, bear with me one second here. I apologize for all of this. A meeting of G20 finance ministers and central bank governors in the Indian state of Gandhi Nagar has ended without a final uh, agreement. The Indian finance minister told reporters that there is, quote, no common language in the crisis in Ukraine, but that some progress has been made on debt restructuring for poor countries. China said multilateral creditors should handle debt, and using their terms, in accordance with the principle of common action and fair burden. China said, the, uh, meanwhile, over the two days, the G20 finance chiefs also discussed reforming multilateral development, banks, tax issues, cryptocurrency, uh, regulations as well as financing for climate change. Now, it is day three of talks aimed at reviving climate cooperation in Beijing between China and the United States. CG Tan's Dong Shua has more on U.S. climate envoy John Kerry's visit to Beijing. Kerry's third day in Beijing today began with uh, with a Chinese senior diplomat Wang Yi. Well, they held a, a nearly two hours talk earlier this morning. Wang said that he appreciated Kerry's work in pushing for climate cooperation. And he reiterated that building a green, low carbon, as well as sustainable development path for all nations was not only important for the next generation, but also a shared international responsibility. Well, Wang then referred to uh, President Xi Jinping's goal of building a shared future for humanity, saying a climate cooperation is an inevitable part of that goal and that Beijing is willing to strengthen talks and search for better mutual solutions. One went on and urged the U.S. to implement more pragmatic policies when dealing with China. And Kerry obviously echoed the sentiment. He said uh, President Biden is very committed to uh, stable the China-U.S. relations. Kerry then reiterated that climate is a global issue, not a bilateral issue saying that he hoped that now that this can be the beginning of a new definition of cooperation and of capacity and resolve the differences between the two countries. And he said, and I quote, we both know that there are real differences between China and the U.S., but we are also know that from the experiences, if we work at it, we can find the path ahead in ways that resolve these challenges. And the world is really looking forward to us for that leadership, particularly on the climate issues. So the overall time for the both sides are calling for a change in the broader relationship. And the hope is in climate change cooperation can be an oasis amid the desert of a strained bilateral relations between China and the U.S. Okay, let's get back to our top story. Uh, just a moment ago, I told you that the G20 talks uh, did just end. There was no consensus on Ukraine. And China also says that they, they, these nations need to make a better effort to work together in terms of international debt for nations. Joining us for a closer look at the takeaways from that meeting is Zhong Yuan Zoe Lu, a Maurice R. Greenberg Fellow for China at the Council of Foreign Relations. Zhong Yuan, thanks very much for joining us. I certainly appreciate you bearing with us. Thank you, Sean, for having me. Let's talk about some of the major economic challenges discussed at G20. I hope you were able to hear what I said about uh, China and the discussion about uh, international debt. What's your takeaway from what the finance ministers did discuss, did come away with after this meeting? Uh, well, you know, Sean, you are right that um, uh, the G20 uh, finance ministers meeting this time did not end with major uh, agreement with, in particular, uh, China and Russia objected to the condemnation of Russia's war against Ukraine, right? And um, uh, the primary concern that the finance ministers talked about is uh, on the one hand, there is the rising uh, rising data challenges among low-income countries, and then there is also the climate change threat. And there is also uh, a discussion about a food crisis as well. Mm. So a lot of these challenges are indeed um, not easy to dealt with given the rising geopolitical uh, threat, uh, as well as rising interest rate in developed economies. Yeah, let's talk about that, especially for developing nations that are just saddled with a large debt right now and so much of the global economy uncertain, the concern about inflation, perhaps dipping into a recession. What do you think is the major challenge that the G20 needs to focus on in terms of rising debt among low-income nations? Well, I think the G20 minister, uh, finance ministers meeting did 
did um, uh, recognize that uh, there are a combination of factors at play that caused a rise of uh, debt or indebtedness, government indebtedness among low-income countries in particular. And a lot of these factors include expanding debt during the uh, COVID pandemic and because of expanded uh, government expenditure to deal with uh, COVID pandemic, uh, as well as the lockdown, and uh, which caused a slower economic growth. And then there, on top of that, there is also the rise of uh, the, the, the cost of living crisis mm. and uh, related to food crisis that largely due to uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. And then on top of that, there is also rising interest rate uh, in advanced economies that as an effort to fight against inflation in developed economies. So a lot of this really uh, may, mean for develop, uh, low income economies, this basically means that they can either pay their debt by way of more stringent austerity or give up there are investment opportunities in education, social health care, mm. or other sustainable development goals. Uh, Zhang Yong, uh, meeting in an Indian state, I'm willing to bet it was extremely warm there during this discussion, something people in China, the United States, in Europe, everyone seems to be dealing with right now. What is going to make all these nations, G20, others, really deal with the threat of climate change? You know, Sean, that's a, an excellent point. I, I am right now in New York, and it is extremely hot these days, and it has been hot for um, for several days, I would have to say. And uh, the, the major fundamental disagreement between uh, low-income economies and advanced economies is that low-income countries, they consider themselves, uh, did not contribute to climate change, and they consider that they, they, many of them, including China, thinks that, uh, actually, or India, for that matter, um, they would consider that advanced economies should to bear more of the burden. Um, but right now, um, there has not been a major consensus in terms of who should contribute more. Uh, and this has been a problem you know, revo uh, throughout uh, G uh, COP26, COP27, while there has been discuss discussion about uh, equal, equal transition. Uh, so far, nobody has agreed on who should contribute how much to the uh, climate change fund. And there's also the argument, I think many people really say the fact that the Trump administration really set the United States back uh, severely in that effort as well. But kind of switch gears. Let's talk about the relationship between the United States and India right now, especially when it comes to China. Is there some kind of dance going on? Uh, yes, there has been, and uh, recently Moody received extraordinary state uh, reception in the White House, and actually many people in Washington, D.C. said that um, this is actually quite extraordinary, and people even debated to what extent Moody deserves to uh, receive such high standard uh, reception. Uh, well, that, that being said, I would say to a large extent, India uh, so far recognized that it has this unique position uh, in terms of the dealing with the United States and uh, Russia and China, and perhaps to a lar very large extent, uh, Moody government considers that it probably the United States need India more uh, at this moment, mm -hmm. uh, given that on the one hand there is the ta that there is a supply chain diversification, right. there is on, on the other hand there is uh, India's balancing role between U.S. and China, U.S. Russia, and India's major role in the BRICS economies. So from that perspective, uh, I think Mood, uh, Moody government indeed has a lot of cards to play. Yeah, and also, I, I think if you look back at the Trump administration, once again playing America first for four years while China was really, really going out there and working on securing some very important trade deals as well. How is inflation and the global south playing out at the G20? Um, inflation is a major challenge, and in fact, um, you know, right now, I would latest data, despite that uh, the Federal Reserve may not necessarily be satisfied, but indeed we have seen uh, at least the inflation in the United States has uh, tamed down a little bit. You know, the rise of inflation uh, rise rise slower than anticipated. Um, the West. The, the, the when Western central banks try to deal in, deal with the inflation, they raise the interest rate, and the negative consequence for the developing for low income country or developing world that basically means a capital flight because when advanced economy raise the interest rate, the capital is going to seek for higher mm. uh, rate of return. That basically means a lot of the international investors they are going to pull money out of developing economies. That means capital flight. Zhang Yuan, thank you so much for your insight, and I'd like to say the temperatures are going to get better in New York, but 
if you're going to be there for a while, be prepared to sweat. Thank you again. Thank you, Sean, for having me.